Welcome to Ashburton Presbyterian Church, and it's great to be able to connect with you on this Lord's Day. Whether you are just visiting us online for the first time or whether you are already a member, I sincerely hope that you can hear the voice of the living God through the word preached, through the word read, and through the word sung in today's worship. So welcome, and may our triune God bless you richly in today's worship in Jesus Christ. Now, I think one of the things that uh, we can learn from this whole pandemic is that we should never underestimate the power of small things, especially when they have the power to kill. I don't want to believe everything the media say about the coronavirus, but it was reported numerous times that if the lead, national leaders had responded to this virus sooner than they did, if they had recognized the danger of this virus earlier than they did, then we could have avoided all these extensive and global chaos. They say, had the leaders recognized how quickly the virus could spread between person to person early on, had they recognized how dangerous this virus could be early on, then we could have avoided all the catastrophe that unfolded so rapidly. Well, I don't know whether those reports are fair, but I think there's a point we can agree on which is that we should never underestimate or undermine the power of a virus that can kill human lives so easily. Those viruses are so small that we can't even see them with our physical eyes with the, without the help of microscopic lenses. Yet their powers are devastating and overwhelming, and we should never underestimate what they can do to human lives just by looking at, at their size. Looking at their size. And don't we see from, from this a valuable lesson that we should never underestimate the power of sin. The power of sin. Sin has the power to disorient us. It has the power to distract us and more importantly, it has the power to destroy us. Some sins may look trivial and light, but we have to bear in mind that all sins have the power to destroy us. All sins. And recognizing that power, you know, that, that devastating, devastating and destructive power, and also controlling that power, is very, very important for Christians to do because we Christians are called to follow the will of our Lord Jesus Christ who is the provider and giver of righteousness. So as we come to our God in worship this morning, let's remember that in order to know the devastating power of sin and in order to control our sinful desires, we need the Word of God. We need the Word of God. And Hebrews 4 verse 12 says this, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God has the power to kill our sins, and we should never underestimate that power. God's Word has the power to cut through the heart and give life to it. And we should eagerly pray for that power to act and progress in our soul. So, do you want to come closer to God in your life? Do you want to live a holy life in the presence of God, in the presence of our pure and righteous God? Then you should come closer to his word. Because God can penetrate into the depths of your being through his word. 
And at the same time, you can look into the thoughts and intentions of God in the Word by the power of His Spirit. The Word and Spirit work together, and we should eagerly pray for the Spirit to work in us through the Word, not apart from it. So as we sing to God, um, as, we, as we pray to Him and give ears to the declaration of, of His Word, let's do all these wonderful acts of worship with a recognition that God's Word has the power to kill our sins, but also to give life. So let's come to Him with a devoted heart this morning and seek His mighty power to change us. So to that end, let's pray and ask God for His blessing. And let's also bless God for His grace, grace upon us in His Son, Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are relieved that you know all things. You know the ins and outs of our being. You know the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And because you know everything, we can trust you as the perfect physician of our souls. You know what to fix, you know what to heal, and you know what to kill. So, Father, we pray that you would show us more about our sins through this worship. And at the same time, please show us your righteousness, the hope for our troubled souls. We need your power and presence this morning, so please be close to us. We thank you and we seek you. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in response to God's call to worship, let's sing, all, sing together, Hallelujah for the Cross, and Jesus paid it all. These are beautiful songs that praise our Lord Jesus Christ. So wherever you are now, please join us in singing, Hallelujah for the Cross, and Jesus paid it all. I'll have no need to fear that 
rest. This hope will guide me into death. Hallelujah. and pray, find in me thine all in all, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. to save, my lips shall still repeat, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Now this time, Nam will be reading our first Bible passage, and it comes from Acts chapter 10, verse 1 to 29. And after the Bible reading, Gay will share a little bit about the mission spot as well. Good morning. The first Bible reading is taken from Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 29. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up 
as a memorial offering before God. Now, send men to Juppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open, and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The boy spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet, the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the man sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The man replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is righteous and God-fearing man, who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to come, to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the man into the house to be his guest. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expected, expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with, with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? This is the word of God. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you're all doing really well um, as we come out of lockdown and looking forward to seeing you all again. This month, our mission donation is uh, in connection with the shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child. Now, we may have been in lockdown, but God certainly isn't. And we've been working steadfastly in this time towards um, collecting goods and hope that we will be able to fill at least 50 shoeboxes. This means that we'll need to raise $500, which is $10 a box, to be able to send the boxes to the children. And this money is not only needed for the transporting of the boxes, but it also covers the field workers who follow up and tell the children about Jesus under the world's greatest story. So I place this before you. Um, the goods are being collected and we have various people making items for the shoe boxes. Um, so we look forward to now collecting the money necessary uh, to be able to shoe uh, send the shoe boxes uh, once they've been packed. I'll now just lead us all in a short prayer for this work. Lord, we pray for the children who will receive our boxes this year, that each child will receive the box meant for him or her, 
and that they will be truly blessed by it. We pray for everyone in our church who has contributed to goods for the boxes, for the packing that we will be doing, and for those that will be checking them later on when we deliver them to the warehouse. We also pray for those that will play a part in delivering them to the children, and we pray for the follow-up teaching of The Greatest Journey, that that will touch the children's heart and turn their hearts towards you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tenemos, digamos, muchas necesidades porque eh, los niños son niños desplazados, ¿sí? familias desplazadas. Algunas vienen de Venezuela, otros vienen de otras regiones y eh, están aquí pues, eh, buscando digamos, un bienestar o algún terreno propio para poder ellos vivir. Operación Niño en la Navidad distribuye cajitas de regalo a través de todo el mundo impactando en lugares de necesidad, un lugar así como este, donde pudimos impactar la vida de los niños a través de demostrándoles el amor de Cristo. Esto fue una sorpresa, alegre. Para ellos, contento porque me llegaron útiles para el colegio y el juguetico, sí, para ellos una alegría. Yo les digo que muchas gracias, que les, se les agradece mucho, que porque esto da mucha alegría para muchos niños que no tienen tampoco cómo comprar. Entonces, se les agradece mucho de corazón. Que Dios los bendiga. Sí, son familias muy necesitadas y familias que han pasado situaciones difíciles, desplazados y necesitan saber que Dios les ama a ellos. Entonces, eso les impactó a ellos mucho. Let's turn our attention to the New City Catechism, and today we will, we will look at question 24, which is about the death of Christ. So let me begin by answering the question, and we will finish by reading the answer and praying the prayer together at the end. So question 24 asks, asks this question, Why was it necessary for Christ, the Redeemer, to die? The answer is, since death is the punishment for sin, Christ died willingly in our place to deliver us from the power and penalty of sin and bring us back to God. By his substitutionary atoning death, he alone redeems us from hell and gains for us forgiveness of sin, righteousness, and everlasting life. Colossians 1, verse, 1, verse 21 and 22 say this, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And Mark Dever writes this, why was it necessary for Christ, the Redeemer, to die? Christ lived the perfect life, the life you and I should have lived. He lived a life of love, of service. He lived an amazing life of trust in his Heavenly Father. So the question is a pressing one. Why should one like that die? Why was it morally necessary? Well, he didn't have to die for his own sake. If we were thinking just about Jesus, there would be no necessity for the cross. No, he died because he would be the Redeemer. It was his will and also his Heavenly Father's will to redeem us. It was his will to lay down his life, to sacrifice himself by dying on the cross in order to rescue us from the penalty that we deserved. You see, because God is good, he will punish sin. That wrong thing that you and I have done in secret, God knows about it. God's real. He's not just an idea. He's not just a figment of our imagination. And this God is so thoroughly committed to what is good and right that every sin will be punished. And this is where Jesus comes in. Jesus determined to be our Redeemer, 
and it was the will of his heavenly Father that he that he give himself as a sacrifice in substitution. That's a word that's often used as a substitute in the place of instead of you and me. Jesus is our substitute if we repent of our sins and turn from them and trust in him. So why did the Redeemer need to die? Because that's the only way you and I would live. So if we can go back to the question, why was it necessary for Christ the Redeemer to die? And let's say the answer together. Since death is the punishment for sin, Christ died willingly in our place to deliver us from the power and penalty of sin and bring us back to God. By his substitutionary atoning death, he alone redeems us from hell and gains for us forgiveness of sin, righteousness, and everlasting life. And let's pray this prayer together. Atoning Savior, thank you that you didn't turn back but endured all the way to death on the cross and beyond. Because of your death, we can live eternally. With this knowledge, help us face our own deaths with courage, faith, and hope. Amen. Now this time, let's continue our prayer to God. And this time, let's confess our sins before him. And in doing so, let's remember that our lives should be marked by continual repentance. And in fact, Martin Luther captured it, I think, really well when he said in his famous 95 Thesis, When our Lord Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. So just as the double blessing God gives to his people are righteousness and forgiveness, let's come to God as repentant saints, as repentant saints. And because we are praying to a forgiving God, let's be very honest in what we confess and what we repent. He sees us and he hears us, and there's no point in deceiving our God. So let's spend a minute now to reflect on our past week and let's confess our sins, sins to our merciful Father. So let's pray. Our merciful Father, too often we have undermined the power of sin. Too often we thought it would be okay to be angry because we could justify our motives. And too often we thought you would be okay even when we believed in the things that contradicted your will. But Father, you are the standard of goodness and righteousness. And we, when we compare ourselves to you, we quickly recognize that we've been too sinful in our thoughts, desires, and actions. So, our Lord, show us your standard of goodness. Show us the scope of your righteousness. And because you are our forgiver, we seek forgiveness from you in Jesus. And we also ask you to deliver us from these sins, because in Jesus Christ, you are also our deliverer. Give us a desire to pursue godliness and avoid wickedness. And please be closer to us as your presence has the power to change us. So as we thank you for being our gracious Father, we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.
Now, in response to the gospel of forgiveness and reconciliation, let's sing This I Believe. This is a song that captures some of the essential truths of our triune God. So, please join our voices together by singing This I Believe. Now, Nam is now going to pray for the church and for the world on our behalf. So let's come to God together in prayer. Let's pray for the world, our country, and our church. Before that, let me read James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 12. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. In verse 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised those who love Him. Our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Saviour, You are our holy and righteous God, just and upright in all ways. We adore and exalt your holy name. Your mercy is like the morning dew, fresh and reassuring. You love us so much that you send your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sin, to redeem us from all our unrighteousness, for which 
we are eternally grateful. Heavenly Father, we pray for the world which is still facing unprecedented tough time where the COVID-19 is still not contained. There are many people infected in South America, India and Indonesia where because of the large population and poverty, social distancing is not possible and health care is poor. There are still widespread unemployment and debt level have gone off the roof. We pray for your mercy to help the world leaders make wise decisions and to enable the scientists and researchers quickly develop a vaccine for COVID-19. As believers, may you strengthen our faith to reinforce in us that you have a divine purpose and to consider it pure joy whenever we face trials. Help us to persevere during this difficult time. May we be obedient to your calling and your word. May we take this time to reflect on your goodness, your holiness and your love for us. Help us to be good witness for you and may our lives be a living testimony for you. May your Holy Spirit enable us to be caring and loving to one another, engaging with one another. We pray for Australia that you empower our leaders with wisdoms as they continue to steer the country into safety. We pray that the recent protest demonstration will not lead to a second wave of infection. We pray that Australians will not be carried away by the protest and compromised on the health warning by the authorities. At Ashburton Presbyterian Church, we pray for the health and general well-being of everyone, that you continue to watch over each one of us. We pray for the various community groups, that as we gather together in Zoom fellowship, learning and sharing on the book of Acts, we will grow to love your word and be encouraged to read more. For only through your living word, we can get to know you. We pray also for more to join in the prayer meeting before the service and so also the Q&A session after the service. This morning, we want to commit Rachel Oaks in prayer. We thank you for giving her the opportunity to work in Sydney for her safe arrival and also enabling her to find an accommodation with another Christian girl. Lord, may you help her to settle in the church and make good friends. When she starts work next Monday, she will be able to find favours with her superior, peers and patients. This morning, we pray that our worship will be sweet aroma to you. May our worship be in spirit and truth, praising your holy almighty name. We pray for the message this morning that you will fill our hearts and mind and that the Holy Spirit will convict and transform us to help us grow in maturity. In all this, we pray in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. This time, Gay will be reading the second Bible passage, which comes from Acts chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 30 to 48. And this is the word of the Lord that endures forever and stands forever. So let's open our hearts and receive God's truths. Good morning, everybody. The second reading is taken from Acts 10, verses 30 to 48. Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. 
Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism when, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptised with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. And just before Barry brings the word to us, let's sing once more. And this time, let us sing, What Love, My God. And after singing this song, Barry will preach from Acts chapter 10. So as we open our hearts to receive God's word, let's sing once more, What Love, My God. My God, what love my God could bring you down to earth? What king would take a low and lonely birth? Yet to this dark and broken place you came to sleep beneath the stars that you had made. love my God would send the way of life to walk the road rejected and despised that you might know the weakness I possess and be my rock of strength and righteousness Oh your love Great. 
anxious and extreme was strong enough to come and fight for me to go through hell and down into the grave and raise me up to see you face to face you raise me Well, as we come to God's word this morning, uh, let's pray and ask his help uh, to take it into our minds and hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you speak to us in your word. We thank you that your word is life transforming, uh, that your Holy Spirit takes it, ap applies it to us in the very core of our being uh, to transform us. Uh, thank you that your word changes our, uh, our thinking, our attitudes, uh, and the things that we love. Father, we pray that you would be at work in each of us today, uh, doing your perfect will, um, changing us, that we would become more like Jesus uh, and live for him uh, and to his glory. Uh, with a clear witness in this world uh, and in our relationships with each other. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you couldn't have missed the, the headlines over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, the tragic death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, and in the wake of his killing, the, the worldwide protests of, of outrage uh, at what took place. Uh, people protesting in cities around the world, including our own, uh, under the banner uh, that Black Lives Matter. I think we uh, and anyone else with a sense of compassion and, and with some kind of sense of justice is shocked by the killing of George Floyd. Uh, a man who was uh, an African-American, uh, a, a gentle giant, uh, a Christian whom Christianity today uh, said was a mentor to young men uh, in a rough neighborhood in Houston known as the Bricks, telling them that God trumps street culture Someone commented his faith was a heart for the third ward that was radically changed by the gospel. And his mission was empowering other believers to be able to come in and push that gospel forth. As Christians, we are outraged uh, and we agree with the, the sentiment that Black lives matter. Uh, in fact, all lives matter. Every human being is created in the image of God. But there is a sense in which the, the Black Lives Matter movement, which was founded in 2013, says too much and it says too little. 
it says too much because the movement is much broader than the name suggests. It's not just about race. Uh, it affirms a lot of things that Bible-believing Christians uh, simply cannot agree with. Uh, it also says too little in the sense that it is not just black lives that matter, but every life matters. Uh, it, perhaps it, we think in the words of that the old Sunday school song, we, we want to affirm uh, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. There is no privilege belonging to people of any skin colour or any race or any language or any level of education or, or any socioeconomic status. The message of the gospel is this. Jesus Christ himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of his hostility that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. The Apostle Paul uh, also wrote to the Christians at Colossae, saying, Here, that, that is in Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but, in Christ, but Christ is all and in all. You see, God makes no distinction. And that's the, the great lesson of this chapter in Acts that we're looking at this morning, Acts chapter 10. Uh, it's the lesson that the Apostle Peter had to learn. Uh, it's a lesson of, of this passage that we need to learn, not just intellectually, but it needs to go into our hearts. It needs to go into our attitudes. It needs to go into our actions. And there's also a lesson behind the lesson. And that is that we must be prepared to subject our thinking and our attitudes to the word of God. We need to be teachable. We need to be open to correction. John Stott said the principal subject of this chapter is not so much the conversion of Cornelius as the conversion of Peter. Cornelius is converted as he is saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Peter is converted in that his heart, his attitude is changed to be more like Jesus, more like God. When Moses received the law from God and, and gave it to the people, there, there were food laws that the Lord included. Uh, and the purpose of the food laws was twofold. Uh, firstly, it was to guard the Israelites uh, and secondly, it, it was to teach them lessons uh, about holiness, about what it means to be the Lord's people in the world. Uh, and it was to teach them to make wise choices. Uh, the children of, uh, of Israel w were like children needing rules from their parents about things like stranger danger, you know, don't, don't get in the car with anyone you don't know. The food laws serve the same kind of function. They, they were to create a difference. They, they created a barrier to keep the Israelites safe. But the Israelites misinterpreted the law. They, they lost sight of their own sinfulness 
uh, and of God's great mercy in, in choosing them to be his people. Uh, and they began to think of themselves as naturally better than the people around them, naturally better than the other nations. Uh, and they became filled with racial pride and they thought the Gentiles, that is, everyone who was not a Jew, uh, were nothing more than dogs. They did not learn lessons about holiness. And they thought that simply keeping the rules like eating the right food made them right with God, no matter how they then lived their lives or what they did. And they began to think of God as their possession rather than themselves as his possession, uh, as his people. They ignored what God had revealed uh, about the nations uh, right from the very beginning. Uh, it, it, God was clear that all the nations were within the scope of his saving activity. And so God blessed Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. He made Israel uh, a kingdom of priests to mediate his presence among the nations. Uh, and the prophets pointed forward to a day when the nations would come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons, quite possibly a reference to Gentiles, your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. God's embrace of, of the Gentiles in his saving purpose is also seen clearly in God's command to Jonah to, to preach the coming judgment to the city of Nineveh that, that then ends in their salvation. And we might note, Jonah was in the same city 800 years earlier before Peter was in the city of Joppa. And Jonah ran from God's command to take the message to the Gentiles because he feared God would save them. He considered them unworthy of God's mercy. And the, the question faces us, uh, what will Peter do? Uh, as we look at this passage, what will Peter do? Well, we've already seen God has been softening Peter's attitude. Uh, Peter, uh, at the end of chapter 9, we see he stays in the house of Simon the Tanner. Um, a very unusual choice. Simon, by, by reason of his trade, was a man who was perpetually, uh, ritually unclean. Uh, and yet Peter stays with him. But there's more work to be done in Peter's heart. Uh, and we see how God is continuing to work in Peter. Uh, he's praying on the roof. The roof of Simon's house. He is, he's hungry. Uh, it's the middle of the day. And God gives Peter a vision. We read in chapter 10 and verse 11. That Peter saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Peter is praying to the Lord. He has this vision from the Lord. He has a, 
uh, a command from the Lord, uh, and, and yet he resists it. Uh, Derek Thomas uh, notes that Peter had a habit of calling Jesus Lord uh, and saying no to him in the same breath. Well, Peter was soon to see that th this vision was not about Peter's dining habits, but it was uh, about people. It's not about his attitude to food, but his attitude to people. Ken Hughes comments, uh, Cornelius, all his soldiers, all his servants, all the Roman people, all other nations on the face of the earth, all mankind were bound up together in one loathsome bundle and Peter was standing above them, surveying them all and spitting out revulsion and rejection. Peter was about to see in living colour his cold attitude. Teeming millions were stone blind spiritually and yet... Peter's callous reply was, surely not, Lord. We read in verses 15 and, and 16, and the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call uncommon. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Just at that moment, at that very time, messengers from uh, a Gentile, Cornelius, uh, a Roman centurion, uh, arrive at the gate to Simon's house and they're looking for Peter. And the Holy Spirit said to Peter, verse 19, Behold, three men are looking for you, Rise and go down to them and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down and said, I am the one you were looking for. What is the reason for your coming? Friends, I wonder if there's we might be uh, sometimes a little bit like Peter. Uh, I wonder if there's anyone that we might think is unworthy of God's grace. Uh, I wonder if there are people that you think are, are beyond the reach of God's grace or, or they're undeserving perhaps because they have done something that is so bad. Or, or there's those whose arrogance you despise, or, or there are people who have hurt you in the past and, and you think God could not be merciful to them. Those who have betrayed you and their betrayal still stings. Those perhaps who, who you, you think God could not show grace to because they don't measure up spiritually. You know, that church down the road. Perhaps you've begun to think the whole world is, is beyond rescue. Uh, and so you give up on the world and you disengage from it. When we look down on others, friends, uh, w with a critical or, or judgmental spirit uh, and we think that God could not accept them because they are not like me, we show how much our, our hearts have been consumed by pride uh, and how much we ourselves stand in need of God's grace. L like Peter Perhaps even while we seem to be closely fellowshipping with Christ and generally we are living close to him and serving him, we can have unacceptable attitudes towards others. 
Uh, and if that's the case, what, what danger we are in. Uh, Kent Hughes comments, if we do not respond to Christ's prodding and let him change our heart attitudes, our relationships with people will suffer and eventually our relationship with God as well. Well, Peter's vision from the Lord ties in perfectly to what God is doing in Caesarea. At the very same time, a, a port city uh, built by Herod the Great, some 55 kilometres or so to the north of Joppa, where Peter is staying. We read in verses 1 and 2. Uh, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Cornelius was a Roman centurion, uh, perhaps the equivalent of a, a captain in a modern army. Uh, we're told he was a God-fearer. That is, Cornelius, who had once perhaps worshipped all kinds of uh, Roman gods, had now come to faith in the one true God, the maker of heaven and earth. Uh, and Cornelius also led his family in worship of the Lord. Uh, and he was a prayerful man and a generous man. But as a God-fearer, he had not yet converted to Judaism. He, he had not yet been circumcised. He, he was still considered a Gentile. And so despite his generosity to, to the Lord's people, no Jew would enter his house. No Jew would eat with him. But God was at work drawing Cornelius and his whole family to himself. That day before Peter had his vision, uh, 55 kilometres away to the north, uh, an angel appeared to Cornelius. Uh, we read in verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, that is a, an hour of prayer, Cornelius would have been praying if he's following Jewish customs. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in, come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. Uh, unquestioningly, Cornelius uh, uh, is obedient to this vision. Uh, he sends two servants and a soldier uh, south to Joppa to seek Peter and to bring him back. And they arrive at the gate of Simon's, Simon the Tanner's house 21 hours later, just as Peter had his vision. Uh, and it's no coincidence, is it? We see that God had the hand of God all over this. Those men meet Peter. They're invited to stay at Simon's house overnight and they set out for Caesarea the next day. And Peter takes six Jewish brothers with him, including Peter, seven witnesses in all who are able to testify to the things that happen. And they arrive 
in Caesarea the following day, the fourth day, to find uh, a waiting audience, uh, an eager audience. You see, Cornelius has been waiting for Peter to come with great anticipation. Uh, perhaps one of the servants ran ahead to tell Cornelius they were getting close. And in verse 24, we read, Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. His family were there. His, his close friends were also there to meet Peter, to hear what he had to say. Uh, they were possibly other God-fearers, uh, possibly fellow soldiers. When the door opened, when Peter arrived, two, two notable things happened. Uh, Peter goes in. <laughs> That's remarkable. He goes into a house of a Gentile. Uh, and secondly, Cornelius prostrated himself. Uh, we read in verse 24. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up. I too am a man. And he talked with him and went in and found many persons gathered. Peter, at this moment, recognises that he and Cornelius are on an equal footing before the Lord. The, the men, that they are both men who stand in need of grace. They are both sinners who stand in equal need before God of God's grace. Peter wasn't saved by his Jewishness uh, and Cornelius wasn't saved by his good life and his alms giving. That they are both sinners who are saved only by faith in Jesus and it is the Holy Spirit who, who distributes sovereignly the gift of faith and changes people's hearts. And we see God. God is the author of this encounter between Peter and Cornelius. He, he brought it about so Cornelius would hear the good news about Jesus. Cornelius says in verse 33, Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all you have been commanded by the Lord. That's the best lead up to a sermon that any preacher has ever had. Uh, uh, imagine that if it happened in churches on a Sunday morning. Uh, we are all here in the presence of God to hear what you have been commanded uh, by the Lord. And Peter, with this eager congregation, preaches to them. We read in verse 34, So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. And Peter preached Jesus. And he preached to the Gentiles what he preached to the Jews. Uh, Luke gives us a, a summary of what Peter said. Uh, Peter spoke about Jesus' life. He spoke about what Jesus, God incarnate, did as he lived among us. He spoke of Jesus' death on the tree. The significance of referring to a tree is that under Old Testament uh, law, someone who died on a tree was cursed by God. There Jesus died in the place, in our place, as the satisfier 
of the penalty that is due to our sin from God. And he preached Jesus' resurrection. Jesus as the living one who is the giver of life. And Peter himself could give eyewitness testimony to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead and that he saw him and multitudes saw him. And he proclaimed Jesus as the judge of the living and the dead, the one before whom we must all stand and give an account of our lives. And he preached Jesus as the one true hope. In verse 43, he says, everyone who believes in him, everyone, no matter what color of the skin, no matter what background or social status or anything else, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter didn't even get to finish his sermon. Peter, Peter didn't get to give an altar call uh, at the end of his sermon. We read in verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, while Peter was still preaching to them, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And we see it's the Holy Spirit who saves. It's the Holy Spirit who saves. Uh, and Luke goes on to tell us in verse 46, Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. At Caesarea, Peter held his first Gentile worship service. Peter conducted his first Gentile baptism. Uh, and Peter started his first Gentile discipleship group as he stayed with them for some days to continue to, to teach them uh, and tell them about Jesus. And friends, it's abundantly clear, God makes no distinctions between people. He receives people from any nation, from any race, from any class, not on the basis of who they are or, or what they've done, but on the basis of who Jesus is and what he has done. And we're faced with the fact we are all equally unworthy. Whoever we are, we are all equally unworthy. And we also see God is indiscriminately gracious. God is indiscriminately gracious. The Apostle John later had a vision of what heaven will be like. He says, After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Friends, God makes no distinction, and neither must we. To the Colossians, Paul said, Here in Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all.
we can learn the lesson of this chapter. But perhaps it will only do us limited good unless we learn the, the lesson behind the lesson. Uh, and, and that is this, that just as Peter, despite his initial protests, and yes, his, his later fall for a, uh, a moment into hypocrisy, uh, was just as Peter was open to the teaching of God's word, to hear his voice, to have his heart attitudes corrected where, where they were in error, so must we be open to what God says to us through his word. We, we might say Peter had a Berean spirit. Remember when Paul and Silas preached the gospel um, in the synagogue in the Greek town of Berea after they had to leave Thessalonica? Uh, and we read in Acts 17, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures to see if these things were so. Many of them believed with not a few Greek women and high standing, of high standing and men as well. You see the, these Jewish people in the Greek town of Berea didn't subject God's word to their own judgment, but they subjected their judgment to God's word. And that requires humility. It requires humility and submission. It requires the opposite of pride. They had a willingness to submit their own thinking to the word of God as the source of truth, and they had the willingness to have their thinking changed by it and to accept correction and to acknowledge where they were wrong. They were, they were willing to have their opinions uh, and their understanding changed by the Holy Spirit uh, and, and have their lives realigned with God's truth uh, and in that city of Berea it, it meant that they accepted Jesus as their saviour. Derek Thomas comments, uh, we should not miss the fact that in the end Peter's will was yielded entirely to Jesus' command. Peter did what Jesus told him to do. He had one master, Jesus Christ. However difficult the task, Peter's response was to say, in effect, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Uh, I wonder if we uh, come to God's word prepared to have our beliefs, our thinking, our, our attitudes, uh, our, our loves, our, our pursuits, our actions realigned by the Holy Spirit so that they align with the heart of God. They become subjected to his word. That, that we don't stand in, a, in our own pride and say, I, I know this is so because this is what I believe, but we're willing in humility to come under God's word and have our, our thinking and the attitudes of our hearts fall into line with it. Can this be said of us, friends? Paul told Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. 
and no matter how close we are to him, just as Peter was close as an apostle doing the work of Jesus, no matter how close we are to him, where the Lord needs to, may he break down our pride and give us teachable hearts and willing spirits to obey him. Well, as we, we look at Acts chapter 10, we see the Holy Spirit change Peter's heart. He, he came to realise that Gentile lives matter. And he not only acknowledged it, but he lived it out. He, he acted on it. He went to Cornelius. He preached the gospel to him. He received hospitality. And he lived out the fact that there is no difference. Secular movements like uh, Black Lives Matter can seek through protest to enforce change, to bring change by law. But secular movements can never alter the attitude of the heart. They can't change the human heart. And I think George Floyd knew only the gospel can do that. Friends, may the word of God in the hands of the Holy Spirit can continue to change us as we dwell upon his word, as we read it, as we meditate on it, as, uh, as we let it determine our thinking, our attitudes. And may we also have the clarity and the boldness that Peter had to point others to Jesus, to point them to, to Jesus who alone can break down the dividing wall of hostility. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for Peter's willingness to be, have his attitude changed. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit that kept chipping away at Peter and brought about this remarkable change in attitude uh, as his heart was transformed. And Father, we, we pray that we would so love your word uh, that we would be transformed by it. We pray that the Holy Spirit will give us the grace not to stand in authority over your word and try to make it fit our prior thinking, but that we would have the grace to stand under your word, to be shaped by it, to have our thoughts uh, and the attitudes and the desires of our hearts transformed by it to your glory. And Father, uh, in this problem-filled world, may we love others as you love them. And Father, may we above all hold out the truth that it is in Jesus alone that the dividing wall of hostility is broken down. It is in Jesus alone that two become one, that enemies become brothers. Lord, may we proclaim that 
without fear or favour. And by grace, may your spirit be at work, transforming lives, transforming communities. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we draw our, our service to a close, uh, we're going to sing a, a, a hymn that expresses the amazement of God's grace toward us. Uh, grace toward people of um, whatever race or, or colour or education or social status or, or language, uh, wherever around the globe, uh, we're going to sing, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood. Let's worship in amazement as we sing this hymn together. And can it be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood Died he for me Who caused his pain For me who him To death pursued Amazing love How can it be That Christ my God Should die for me Amazing, Amazing love So infinite his grace Emptied himself of all but love And bled for Adam's helpless race What mercy this immense and free For God my God it found out me What mercy this Bound in sin in nature's night Your sunrise turns at night to day I woke the dungeon flamed with light My chains fell off, your voice I knew I rose, went out and followed you As we come back to God's word to close our service, let's receive the words of the blessing from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Yeah.